you. Hello, uh, and thank you for asking me to come and do this. It's, uh, it's a really interesting one for me to do, um, because I am, I am normally someone that is, is seen more often than not with pots, pans, whisks, chopping boards, knives, blue and white pennies and things like that, and, and there's always something there that can distract from my uh, garbled uh, conversation. I want to try and get across the power of food and the way in which it can help with communication and connectivity. And I'm, I'm a strong believer that you know, everything, everything will come back down to food eventually. Everything that we do in terms of our, our body and the way in which it functions and our nutrients and our vitamins, but also across the globe in terms of the way in which we use food um, or is being used as a political tool, the way in which it can help with social cohesion, the way in which it can absolutely perform, uh, get encouragements and better performance in our education systems. Um, there is an irony uh, for me in the fact that we are in this building and probably no more than two minutes drive away from here, we have three um, food banks that were currently feeding between 25 and 30 families a week each. We also have the opportunity of a new fantastic um, food store opening which is wonderful that it's going to be employing 30 staff that have come from the job centre, but those 30 staff are very, very unlikely ever to be able to afford the food that's being sold in that new food store. That feels uncomfortable for me in a very modern global economy that we should have people starving on our own doorsteps. We think of third world countries. Well, you know, we are on the cusp here in the UK of a humanitarian food crisis that we have never witnessed before. In the last six months alone, food banks have doubled. Now, 110,000 people we know through a referral system actually going into the food bank system. Those are the ones that are captured in our system, and yet we know that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds aren't. Four million people starving in this country every day. Every day. And actually across all types of society. It's not just the most vulnerable. You are seeing cuts right through to the middle classes as well, where maybe uh, a parent thinks, actually, I'll skip breakfast with my child today, and off they go to school, and it becomes the school's problem. And actually, they might, unfortunately, slip through the net at the school. They come home, and they don't get any tea either. It's a, it's a growing phenomenon, which we should actually be ashamed of in this country. I want to talk about... Um, some of my involvement in both, um, in, well, across public, private and voluntary sector. Uh, I've been lucky enough to work across all three types of uh, income streams and ways of doing things. Uh, and in terms of public sector, I, I, I still remain today um, uh, one part of the future of our NHS as the lay member on the new clinical commissioning group for Gloucestershire. And it's really interesting to see the possible way in which we could really innovate for our health system. I'm not in any way endorsing it's where we want to be, but if that's the opportunity we have, then that's what we should take and we should grasp it. We should try and do the best thing that we possibly can with it. I'm a Michelin rated chef, did all that. It was my ambition, it was my goal, it was my inspiration. It's what I wanted to do. I wanted to serve really great food to the punters that came from my restaurant because I wanted to educate them. I was giving them really great value for money food. Brilliant. I didn't make any money. My business was you know, going down the pan. And actually what happened to me was I fell in love with education. I fell in love with working with children and teachers in schools and the opportunity to be able to reach out to those people and to help them to do better in their lives and using food as the tool to be able to do that. So I started part of my corporate responsibility originally to work with schools. Wonderful, brilliant. We cut forward 15 years now everything that I do is across a social enterprise, whether it be uh, through our community interest company or through our charity, The Wiggly Worm. What I've seen in the last three or four years, though, is quite staggering that the power of food. I am not a clinician in any way, shape or form at all. I, I have a gob on me. That's probably why I'm here. Uh, and I can cook. I, I, I'm a pretty good cook, and I believe I'm a pretty good cook. So the combining of how you run a kitchen in a restaurant environment, which is noisy, dangerous, long hours, antisocial, 
uh, has lots of uh, time constraints and deadlines upon it, is really helpful when dealing with the sort of young people that probably Tanya sees in her clinics. They come to me. They come to me and I try and find a way to make them better. Now I get that with young people, I get that with teenage mums and dads-to-be, I get it with early years children, 0 to 5, uh, I have it with adults with mental health conditions, drug and alcohol addictions, battered wives, uh, stroke victims, brain injuries across the board, you name it. They come to us and we use food to get them better. Now they might think straight away that that is the obvious Okay, so here's a bloke, he does a little demonstration, he shows them actually if you eat apples it's going to be better for you. And this is all very nice. We do do that, that is very nice. And we can get people to understand the benefits of good food in terms of obesity, malnutrition, etc. But actually what we do do with food is give them the understanding of the power that it can bring in terms of communication tool. How it can help them in terms of their deadline setting, how it can help them in terms of their time management how it can help them with their creativity. So what we do uh, one day a week for around about eight or 12 weeks, and actually it works out at no more than 46 hours pretty much in our, in our care if you like, is take them on this journey where we look at them and we say, well, actually, what have we got? We don't look at people and go what they haven't got, which I think we tend to do too much in society. We look about what, well, they haven't got this, they don't do this. You know, youth is a prime example. They don't do this, they don't do that, they don't do this. We won't get them to do that. Actually, what we should do is, yes, but look at what they do do. They are fantastic. We should use that. We should nurture it. We have a guy who's doing one of our courses at the moment. He's been in and out of prison. He's 19. He's been in and out of prison three or four times uh, for car crime. And so eventually when we could break down the conversation with him, well, what, what, is, what is that, mate? What, what, what have you done? Did you just do joyriding? No, no, if you've been in and out of prison three or four times, he steals cars to order. He steals cars to order. He then strips the car down. He does all the new plates. And then he has to find the buyer again to be able to sell it at a huge premium. Brilliant. Brilliant in terms of the skills and the process around business. So let's apply that to the process of what we're doing in our Kitchen Challenge program. So let's see if you can actually help us design the menus, design the product, design the packaging, take it to the marketplace, sell it on, negotiate, brilliant salesperson. So what we do is we look at the strengths of any community and we find ways in which we can really harness that together as a team, as a collective, in order to be able to do things better as a collective. What does that lead to eventually? absolute inspiration and innovation and empowerment to what they want to do in their lives. So over our 46 hours that they're with us, we start off with the basics. Is it lasagna, bolognese, fish cakes, fish pies? And eventually over those 46 hours, they will be running a restaurant and they will be serving a uh, scallop escabeche. Uh, it might be a terrina confit salmon with a chive shabli vinaigrette dressing. It may be uh, a fillet, uh, fillet of roseville with a nice truffle mash, red wine uh, reduction, chorizo red wine sauce. And it might be a hot chocolate fondant with white chocolate sorbet, homemade petit fours, lovely breads. <laughs> 46 hours. The wasters, the losers, the people that our society writes off every day. The people that in our society, in this modern society, are being even more marginalised day after day because of the politics and the policies are wrong. The principles seem to make sense. They absolutely do. There are principles and essence that I like. But the way in which you can communicate that to us as people, as citizens, to make it work is very hard to do. We see amazing success. 90% of the people that come through our programs go back into education, go back into employment, yes into volunteering, which is wonderful and that's all very nice, but what people really want is money. Money sadly makes the world go round. We gave, I gave on Friday, at, we also run the Bistro, Star Bistro at uh, the National Star College, where we've taken what we do around Kitchen Challenge and thought, well, actually, how can we create a social enterprise business where we've got a good product going out there? And let's face it, you want to, if you've got your money's tight, all of us, you want to spend it on a good product. So you've got to give a good product. Whether you're a charity or not a charity, it's got to be great. And they said, well, can you do it? We, we, you know, all our, all our, our, our guys are, are disabled. Yeah, of course we can. 
You know, they've got brilliant smiles, they can move their arms, they can move their legs, they're brilliant welcome hosts. We can do it. Let's look at what they have got. And what we have there is a fantastic environment in which people are really flourishing. Now, one of our Kitchen Challenge participants, who, uh, she's a wonderful lady, and um, she was homeless on the streets of London for nearly three years and did everything that you would imagine someone would need to do to survive uh, in London if you were homeless and uh, you were a woman in particular uh, and also suffered from drug and alcohol addiction. And to be able to give her on Friday her first pay packet in nearly 10 years and see the beam and the smile and the empowerment that that can bring to someone is absolutely amazing. And she would not have got into that position if she hadn't been able to feel relaxed around other people where food was the tool to be able to do that. So it's a wonderful experience to be able to have. Now, food, do you like food? Good. So in here, is what's this ah, I see you say salmon what else is it it's a fish what else is it yes what else is it yes <laughs> it's a round fish it's a round fish okay and actually just through a fish we start to start to have a discussion how many of you in this room have never touched a fish how many of you have never touched a salmon you've never touched a salmon sir Okay, would you like to touch a salmon? Not particularly. Not particularly. I'll let you touch it. I'll t let you touch it later on. A fish is fish is. I'll let you touch my fish. It's not. A, it's not a problem. Rockers is desperate. He's been wanting to do it for ages, years. But it's look. We we. There is an element of wow factor in terms of what we do. Absolutely there is because what we want to set is a real quality in terms of the the food that we have on offer. But wider than just the sort of projects that Kitchen Challenge might have, um, you know, we have to look at where the, where the food is going in our society. Now, we are seeing, I believe, strongly believe that the, the next major wars will be around food and water. You know, you look at the Haiti riots of 2008, 80% of the population were earning around about $2 yeah, a day. That's the sort of income that they were getting. People could not afford to eat you start to see the combination of land grabbing that is going on around the world in our society today, where people will be growing in order to supply their own, uh, their own economies. Combine that with the fact that, quite rightly, in some respects, we have you know, the lovely, beautiful new agri-fuels, environmental fuels. If we stop, actually, and get the balance right between growing environmentally fuels and actually growing food for people to eat, we might be able to afford the food that's coming into our countries and out of our countries. We are in a real state, a real pickle, in terms of what we have. We have a beastie crisis growing out of control. In Gloucestershire alone, we spend £140 million a year on dealing with the consequences of obesity. This county, £140 million a year. Surely it's a no-brainer to say you have to put the right techniques in place, the right communications, maybe through social networking, who knows what it might be. I strongly believe it's about touching, feeling, smelling, getting under the skin, using food as a leveller. You might be the most you know, challenged person in the world with the brightest person in the world. Give you a salmon, you're level. <laughs> you're level. You really are. You know, 140 million on obesity, 140 million on drug and alcohol, around about 138 million pounds uh, on quit smoking. We have a public health crisis in our country that is out of control. Out of control. We also know in terms of malnutrition. Malnutrition is one of the biggest reasons why people do not get better when they leave hospital. Surely it's common sense to be able to feed them properly, identify properly when somebody is likely to be malnourished or are malnourished, feed them properly so they can get better in our system. Evidence shows malnutrition costs our NHS £226 million a year. This is our money. This is our money that can be easily rectified. Easily rectified. Food has this most amazing power, this most amazing empowerment, this most amazing opportunity in terms of a global market that it offers us. To sit round a table with your friends and family 
tucking into, it might be the, sco the, the scallop escabeche, but just tucking into a ratatouille with some French bread or English Hobbs house bread. Did I just mention them online? That's the commission, ka-ching, right? <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's one of the most amazing things you can do. My children are six and five, Jack and Maddie, uh, and, and, you know, touch wood, wherever that might be, touch wood, they are into food. They're, they're, well, they're surrounded by it from their daddy, you know what I mean, and their mummy. I can't change a tyre, by the way, and I can't do anything else. I'm not very good at counting. I was rubbish at school. It was the only thing I could do was cooking. I was the first boy to do it with all the girls at the age of 16. I did O-level cookery. I was bullied for around about two weeks, and then they finally realised, oh, you know, Top Totty is doing it with. And, <laughs> and I was selling my products. Enterprise, play to your strengths. That's what I say. And you know, they love it. Now, my little boy, Jack, you know, he was around a year and a half old. And we went and bought a, I bought a sardine for eight, you know, slightly smaller than this one. Yeah, I bought a sardine for around about eight pence and we slapped that on his high chair. And he played with this sardine, you know, for, for nearly two hours. Was it messy? Absolutely it was messy. It was in his hair, it was on the floor, it was all over the place. I then put that sardine in couscous and he ate it. 8p. 8p. Probably three of the best hours that I've ever had with my son. It's not difficult. Food, uh, you know, put couscous and lentils into plastic cups and shake them as rattles. Use aubergines as mirrors. Give a baby an aubergine. I'm not expecting the baby to eat an aubergine, I know that. But actually look at the aubergine. Look at the shine on the outside of the aubergine. Look at the green bit at the end where it's connected to the, to the plant. The slightly prickliness of the actual uh, green bit as well if it's really, really fresh. Cut the aubergine in half. Look at the inside. Feel the texture that aubergine can bring. Yeah, give that to a child, to a baby to play with. Take it through the stages. Eventually, when it comes to making masaka, or ratatouille, they'll recognise it, they'll want to eat it, it works. I chair the Children's Food Trust, so I'm responsible for uh, pretty much um, taking forward Jamie's wonderful inspiration around school food and uh, school meals. And it's really frustrating to be in an academy, knowing that academies don't have to conform to the standards in legislation anymore. And we hope that most academies will do the right thing, and I gather this one is. But it's a really difficult, difficult time for food in schools to know what to do. But as part of the Children's Food Trust, we run Let's Get Cooking. Five and a half thousand clubs, just under two million people taking part in those cooking clubs. We know it works. 90% of those people now, through the fun, the enjoyment, the tangible experience and communication that food can bring, 90% of those are now cooking from scratch. 60% of them are eating healthier. We have to avoid the food crisis, this humanitarian food crisis that is coming to Britain. That means every single one of us has to do something special with our neighbour around food that can change. And that means thinking about what we buy, how we buy and how we cook it. And communicating that and connecting with our neighbours, our friends and the most vulnerable that we have in our society in order to make our lives and their lives better. Thank you very much.